I want to preach a message, uh, a very special Easter message, and I've entitled it Grave Matters. Now, of all the grave matters that we are facing in our world right now, and it is a very dangerous world, the one I recently came across isn't going to rank very high on any of our lists, but it is a problem. What do you do when you run out of room to bury dead people? That's the problem that they're having in the UK right now, believe it or not. You know, London is a city that's about 2,000 years old. Close to 9 million people live in London, and there are millions of others in repos underneath the city, buried. And they're running out of burial ground. Now, even though 75% of people living in London choose to be cremated at death, the remaining 25%, they have no room. So they got the best minds together to try to figure out and solve this problem, and they've come uh, up with some skeleton ideas, pardon the pun, uh, to solve this problem. Here's what they are going to do, and they're doing. They're digging up old graves that are at least 75 years old, digging up the old person that is in there, digging the hole deeper, placing that person back in the same grave, and then the new arrival will be placed on top of them. And then they bury him, and they turn the tombstone and put the new name of the new arrival on that tombstone, and that way they can kill two birds with one stone. Bad analogy, I know. But think about this. 2,000 years ago, on Easter weekend, the first Easter weekend, On Good Friday, Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior, died on that cross right at 3 in the afternoon. Shortly after that, they took his dead, cold body off of that cross, wrapped it, and according to Jewish law, he had to be buried before the beginning of Sabbath that evening. So they took him to a graveyard, and they placed His glorious body, the Bible tells us, in a borrowed tomb. Now, why a borrowed tomb? Because he wasn't going to be there very long. You see, Jesus checked in to this borrowed tomb a little after 3 in the afternoon on that Good Friday. And he had an early checkout the first day of the week, Sunday morning before the sun rose. Jesus Christ came out of that tomb alive. Woo! And that was... That was the biggest moment in the history of planet Earth. No other event can even come close to significance of what occurred there. Ponder it. Think about it for a moment. Every other world religion, and really of the three largest world monotheistic world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all claim Abraham as their father, They all have the roots of the Judeo faith. But of all the religions and of all the philosophies, none can compare, none can come close to the claim of Christianity. That Jesus Christ was more than a good teacher, more than a prophet. He was the Son of God. And He and He alone predicted that He would face death for all men, for the sins of all men, and that he would conquer it. And sure enough, he kept his word. He rose from the dead. There is no other religion, there's no other belief system that can even come close. Now, many of us have seen the movie Case for Christ, the premiere showing, my wife and I and a bunch of other people were in the theater. It was a powerful movie, well done, well done. I was impressed and I was moved uh, by this true story of Lee Strobel beginning as an atheist and coming to faith in Christ. And the journey that he was on and how with his journalistic background he wanted to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He ends up, you know the story, he ends up coming to faith in Christ because the evidence is just astounding. There is a mountain of evidence, the medical evidence of Jesus dying on the cross, that he did die, the historical evidence that he did live, the archaeological evidence, the eyewitnesses. And there's just a preponderance of evidence that, that it's undeniable that Christ lived, 
and that the resurrection happened. Over 500 eyewitnesses. And that became a game changer. When Christ was raised from the dead, literally the axis of planet Earth shifted. The world shifted and everything changed. The grave matters. The empty tomb matters. And the grave matters in our life whenever we find ourselves in our own life facing a grave matter, a grave issue. The Apostle Paul, who began as Saul of Tarsus and had a glorious conversion on the road to Damascus, and he himself includes himself as one of the eyewitnesses to the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Throughout all of his epistles and all of his writings, the one heartbeat of the Apostle Paul was Jesus is alive and Jesus is coming. That was the theme, the main theme of every sermon. Somehow it found its way in everything that was written in the New Testament. Christ died, Christ rose again, and Christ is coming again. And Paul wanted to convey the significance of that in everyday life, in everyday living. So Paul, the apostle, is in prison, and he begins to write what's called the prison epistles. And one of those letters was the, a letter to the Colossian Christians. And I want you to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 with me. Here's what the apostle Paul says. You have been raised to life with Christ, so set your hearts on the things that are in heaven where Christ sits on his throne at the right side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things here on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your real life <clears throat> is Christ, and when he appears, then you too will appear with him and share his glory. Paul in these verses is saying at least two things to us. When we realize and we identify with the fact that Jesus died and rose again but not only did he die and rise was raised to life again but when Christ died we were raised to life with him once again look at Colossians 3 1 the first part of that verse let's read it out loud together you have been raised to life with Christ now notice Paul says you have been past tense Something happened 2,000 years ago that just did not include Jesus himself. But for everyone that would ultimately put their faith and trust in Christ, when Jesus walked out of that tomb that first Easter morning, you and I and every other Christian that would, every other person that would come to faith in Christ when he was raised from the dead, at that moment, legally, spiritually, by faith, all of us walked out of that tomb of death and Christ forever guaranteed you and I would never have to fear death again. He conquered it on our behalf. Praise God. So past tense, you have been raised to life. That's, that's the Easter message. You were dead. Spiritually, all of us, we enter this world in a state of spiritual death, separation from God. But when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he gives us life, and we are raised to new life. And when that happens, two things, amongst many things, but two things, according to Paul in the, this section of Scripture, two things happen. It changes our attention and our affection. A resurrected Christ alive inside of you and alive inside of me changes our attention in life and our affection in life. Once again, Colossians 3.1, since you were brought back to life with Christ, focus, everybody say focus. Focus on the things that are above where Christ holds the highest position. So because the reality of Christ being alive, being raised from the dead is real, and you and I with Christ have been raised up to this new life, we've been, as Paul says in this translation, brought back to life with Christ. It changes our attention. It changes our focus. Our focus. So many people in our world today are distracted by so many things. 
You cannot underestimate the power of a life that is focused. Where our attention is not just on the things below, but on that which is above. We're all gathered in our churches throughout our great community, throughout our great state, throughout our great country and around the world today. Believers, soon to be believers, save men and women, men and women who are seeking truth and because they know, they know there's a longing and a yearning in their heart that all the things of this world cannot fill, that only Christ can fill. And we come and for this moment our life is reoriented around what is really important through the praise and worship through the prayer, through the preaching, through the ministry, through the the life of a church, our life is reoriented, at least for this one moment, and we can gain our focus, our spiritual focus. That our attention is not just on making a better life, nothing wrong with that. Our attention is not just finishing school, nothing wrong with that. Our attention is not simply on getting married, nothing wrong with that. Or having children and raising children, nothing wrong with that. But our attention is not just on the things below. But on that which is above, that's what the resurrected Christ, Christ alive inside of us, what it produces is this new focus in our life and the power of focus. I remember when I was a uh, freshman in high school, I wasn't saved yet. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but I was uh, selecting elective classes my freshman year. And I, I, I uh, took on a welding class. And I went to the welding class and I thought, you know what, I could always become a welder, right? or I could be a photographer, or I could be a doctor, or I could whatever, right? So I, I started there, and I went to the welding class, and I actually enjoyed it because I always enjoyed playing with fire, <laughs> especially a welding torch. You know, you could have, there are two types of people in this world. There are flamethrowers, and then there are men and women who have a blue tip, white hot focus of intense heat. You know, a flamethrower, it can, it can burn down a lot of things and it can scorch the earth, but a flamethrower can't cut through steel, but a blue tip flame can cut through two inches of steel. So many people go through life like a flamethrower. They're scattered everywhere. But a life that has focus and a life that gives its attention to that which is important in life can accomplish great things. True story. November 15, 1993, a 71-year-old doctor by the name of Tom Amberry stepped into a local gymnasium. He stepped up to the free throw line, true story, and for the next 12 hours, he shot free throw after free throw after free throw after free throw, 12 hours straight. He ended up making 2,750 free throws in a row without missing. He had 10 eyewitnesses. They all signed an affidavit, and he was inducted into the Guinness, world, uh, Guinness Book of World Records, and to this day, he holds the world record for the most consecutive free throws. <clears throat> 10 years after that <clears throat> episode, he began to work with colleges, <clears throat> professional foot, uh, basketball teams, even the Chicago Bulls. He did shoot arounds with professional basketball players, and he never lost a single shoot-around at the age of 81. He was on David Letterman. He was on NBC Nightly News. And they would, in the interviews, they would ask him his secret. What's your secret? He would say this. My secret was focus and concentration. He said, when I'm shooting free throws, I don't think of anything else. I am 100% positive that I will make the basket. I never have a negative thought on the free throw line and he made 2,750 in a row. The power of a life that comes into focus, where distractions are minimized in our lives, that we give our full attention to Christ, to that which above, first and foremost. The power of focus. So many people are distracted today. I saw on on 60 Minutes a, a week ago on Sunday, a former Google executive is the first one to come out and let the cat out of the bag that Google and Amazon and all the social media platforms, there's a scam going on. They want you to be addicted to their electronic media, and they've succeeded. They do things such as they hold back your likes on Instagram and Facebook until the right time based on the uh, algorithms of your usage. 
so that all of a sudden you're like, wow, I got 15 likes, I got 20 likes. It's a reward incentive, reward incentive. That's how you addict people, that's how Las Vegas uh, addicts people to gambling. Reward incentive, reward incentive, until it reconditions and rewires your brain. They've done, neuroscience has done research on this. And here's what they've come to the conclusion. The average person can only stay away from their cell phone for 15 minutes. Some of you right now are sweating because you haven't been able to look at your phone and you know you're getting notifications right now and you just hope that church would hurry up and end so you could look at your phone. But we've trained our ushers, if anyone looks at their phone during church, we'll throw a water balloon at you, amen. Just kidding, don't take me serious. Try it. Try to go an entire day without using your, eye, your phone, your smartphone. See if you don't have a nervous breakdown. I hope you don't. <laughs> Distractions. We've lost our focus on what is really important. But Christ and his resurrected life, it redirects our focus and our attention is not just on the things that are below, but on that which is above. And the second thing that it does, it, it, it impacts and affects our affection. Once again, Colossians 3.2. Paul said, set your affection... I love that word, affection. Set your, set your affection. The other translation we read said set your heart, your emotions, your affection on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Now, you've heard the old saying, and it's true. Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And then the opposite is also true. Some people are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. We don't want to be on either side of the road in a ditch. We don't want to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good to our, our friends, our family, our, our careers, our professions, our callings, and doing life. But we don't want to be so earthly minded, so focused on that which is below that we don't live for that which is above the sun. Uh, Solomon wrote an entire book, the book of Ecclesiastes, and he talks about those who only live for that which is under the sun. All the pleasures of this life. And he experimented with all of the pleasures of this world. And he said, it's all what? Chasing after wind and trying to grasp oil. Until you realize that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. To keep His commandments and to obey Him. The resurrected Christ changes our attention. It changes our affection. There are so many wrong affections in our world, right? The Apostle Paul in Romans 1, 26, he talks about vile affections. And he describes there in Romans 1 what are the vile affections that so many people, their lives are caught up in. In this same book, in the same chapter, verse 5, he talks about inordinate affections. People having affections for the wrong things and, and, and expressing their affections in the wrong ways. Vile and inordinate affections. But then in this verse, he's talking about heavenly affections. A heavenly affection. The importance of setting our attention and our affection above where Christ is seated in heaven. That life on earth really only makes sense and only has purpose and meaning when we have the hope of heaven, of one day being with the resurrected Lord and Savior throughout eternity. There's a man, a famous man. He's a famous secularist thinker, one of the world-renowned secularist thinkers, atheist, his name is Jorgen Habermas. In 2008, he wrote an, an essay entitled, Awareness of What is Missing. An essay entitled, Awareness of What is Missing. What had occurred in his life was in April of 1991, a friend of his, a famous playwright, author, secularist, atheist friend of his, died in Zurich. And he attended the services at St. Peter's Church in Zurich, Switzerland. But something wasn't right. It was ironic that his friend wanted his services to be in this ancient cathedral. But there was no mention of God, no mention of eternity, no prayers offered. And his friend gave specific instructions of what was to be done and not to be done in this service. There, should, there will be no amen. That's literally what he requested. There would be no amen. Jurgen Habermas, in his essay, as an atheist, said, 
We've not yet been able to transition the rite of passage from this world in death, as atheists, he said. Because what does an atheist believe in but nothing? That we basically came from nothing, we are nothing, and there's nothing to look forward to. And in the essay, he began to ponder what it means to live your life without an amen or an hallelujah. You see, in the Christian experience, everything begins with an hallelujah and ends with an amen, an amen. Christ is the amen, that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. And to think that we go through life without an amen, without a sense and a belief and an understanding that all there is to life is not just what is here below, not what is just in this world. Consider for a moment that your life is compared to a football field. You've got one end zone to the other end zone, you've got 100 yards. Now let's, con let's consider your life when it begins. It begins at, at one side of the football field, this end zone, and you begin on the one yard line. And you've got 99 yards to go until you cross the other end zone. And the other end zone is the goal that all of us will have to cross. It's called death. No one gets out of this world alive. And as we progress in our life, in our teens and in our 20s, you know, maybe we're at the 20, 30 yard line. We've got 70 yards yet to go. We're not even really thinking about the other end zone and that that goal that we'll have to cross. But once you get around, you know, your 50s and your 60s and you realize, hey, I'm not even going to live to be 100. Most people don't live to be 100. I may be at the 30-yard line. I may have 30 yards to go. I've got more yards behind me than I have ahead of me. And all of a sudden, you begin to think, what, what gives my life meaning? What gives my life purpose? Paul says, the resurrected Christ changes our attention and our affection because we're all going to have to cross we're all going to have to cross that finish line some sooner than others but we're all going to get there and what happens next for those that have faith in the living lord and savior we know the end really is the beginning it's the ultimate touchdown of all touchdowns <laughs> because we end up touching down you know on what we believe is heaven the streets of glory that's the hope that gives our life meaning because you know what all of us at times are going to face some grave matters in our life and when you face a grave matter, the grave matters. The empty tomb of Christ matters. It changes everything. Allow me in closing to share a personal story. You know, many times we're just going along with life and all of a sudden you get sideswiped. Something happens, unexpected, news comes your way. And I'm used to this as a pastor. 27 years. I can't tell you the people that have come my way and called me, have come up to me and said, pray for me, pray for my family, this, that, or the other. Some of the most tragic events have occurred in the lives of people. And I've always had the great honor and privilege to pray for others and minister to others. Three weeks ago, my wife and I faced a health crisis in my life. I believe uh, every man, because you love God and you love your family, you should get an annual physical. I believe in the power of faith, prayer, and medicine in that order. So I went for my annual physical. This was uh, above and beyond one. They did stress tests, blood work, blah, blah, blah. Everything came back, great report. I'm in the top 19 percentile for my age group concerning health. I take my health very seriously. We all know our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I, I want to live. I don't want to be cheated one single day. So, you know, I don't drink. I don't smoke. And, you know, and, and it's not so much a matter of sin. It's just a matter of being wise and being a good steward of the body that God's given us. But at the end of the exam, the doctor felt around my throat and he said, hmm, something there I don't, I don't like, Carl. You need to go to your primary care physician and get that checked. Well, thankfully, one of our elders is the best ENT, one of the best ENTs in all of America. He said, we'll take care of you, Carl. Come on in, we'll give you an ultrasound. So thank God for all the professional medical staff and how you all care for people. God bless you. They did an ultrasound and they didn't like what they saw. They said, we need to do a needle aspiration where they actually go in there and do a biopsy of your thyroid because there were some nodules on there. Well, two, three weeks ago, had that needle aspiration, and the very next day, the pathology report came back that my doctor called me. He said, Carl, are you sitting down? I said, well, I'm, I was writing my sermon for that following weekend. I was actually at my desk in my chair, yes, literally sitting down. He said, you have papillary carcinoma. I said, say that in English. 
you have thyroid cancer. What? Boom, all of a sudden, you're touched with your own mortality. Whenever somebody, a doctor uses the C word, not for Carl, <laughs> but for cancer, that's a serious moment. He said this, he said, but Carl, if you have to have any cancer, of all the cancers, if you have to have any cancer, the one cancer that you want is papillary thyroid cancer. I said, well, I really don't want any cancer, thank you very much. I said, okay. He said, but we can go in there, surgically remove it. Here's what we're going to do. Come to my office in two days, which that was on a Tuesday. Come on a Thursday. We'll take care of it. He hangs up the phone. I said, wow, God. Momentarily, your life is turned upside down. And you're thinking, all these thoughts are going through your mind. And the first thought that kind of like went through my mind, I'm like, well, God, this didn't take you, this isn't taking you by surprise. And I know one thing. I know you're real. I know you're all powerful. I know you're for me and not against me. I know you love me. I don't know why I'm getting this news. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. I have the victory through Christ Jesus. And either way, we win. No matter what the outcome is, we win. And I'm thankful that I had an amen and an hallelujah. And I had an understanding of what the end zone was going to be like. The goal is heaven. We're all going to get there one day. It's just how and when. I didn't blame God. I said, okay, I need, to, I need to let Gloria know. So I, I texted her. I said, hey, are you available? Because I didn't want to tell her through text. Hey, by the way, your husband, blah, blah, blah. She was in a meeting, so I wasn't able to contact her. So I prayed. I said, I'm going to go back to studying. So I said, you know, I'm just, this ain't going to change my life. So I go back to studying, and then I started thinking, what is, I, I need to get more information. So I, started, I Googled papillary thyroid cancer. And uh, you can get some wrong information, you know, <laughs> on the Internet. And I found out that, you know, for, for cancer, it's a 50% survival rate. I'm like, I don't like my odds right now. 99.9% .9 is what I'm looking for, right? Then I discovered and I realized when it comes to this particular one, it's 90% success rate. And then I thought about all the people that have faced much worse than I had to face. Many of you that have faced much worse or right now are facing much worse. And my heart went out. I thought of all the people that I've had the privilege of praying for. And I thought of your bravery and I thought of your courage. And I thought of those of you that have even lost loved ones to some tragic, untimely death or some illness. And I thought, thank God we all have an amen and, a, and, a, and an hallelujah in our life. That we all have a hope beyond just this world. Well, long story short, two weeks ago this past Wednesday, I was under the knife. They went in there, they, they took out the thyroid and the lymph nodes and they got it all and they took it to pathology and the very next day, my doc calls me and he says, Carl, we got it all out. You're 100% cancer free. <laughs> Praise God, you know, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna need any radiation. God is good, thank you, Lord. And I thought about this journey that my wife and I were on. I was so thankful that I wasn't on that journey alone, that I had a believing wife that knew how to pray. I had sons that knew how to pray. I was so thankful that I was a part of a church that, that knew how to pray. And it's always, it's always others coming up to me, will you pray for me, Pastor Carl? But now it's my turn to be able to come up to my life group, which meets once a month. And we pray, and we have a devotion, and we share a meal, and we do kingdom business together, my fellow elders. And they were able to lay hands on me and pray for me. I can't tell you how much that comforted me, to know that there was a staff around me and friends around me that, that, that were praying and standing in faith with my wife and I and and we all walk through these moments sometimes and we don't know why or how or when but life happens to all of us and no one is bulletproof no one's life is impervious to the trials and tribulations of life but as the psalmist said many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers them out of them all Aren't you glad that no matter what you face or what you go through, you never face it alone. You have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And in the end, one way or the other, God will have the final word because Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive forevermore and it changes our attention and our affection. I did try to maintain my, not only my faith, but my humor through, the, through it all. One of the first thoughts that came to my mind was, wow, Gloria's young and beautiful. I got to find my replacement. <laughs> and I already had somebody in mind, someone in their 70s, five foot two, about 250. But you know, I wasn't going to be picky. 
I thought about the church and thought about my sons and, uh, you know, your life flashes before you. But there was something in me that said, I'm good with whatever the outcome is. And I was going to be, I was going to walk in faith. I wasn't, and, you know, anticipating the worst case scenario, but I was good. And I thought, I've never had to be faced with that in my life. But at that moment, I said, I'm good. And why am I good? Because I know God is good. And I know God is for me. I hope you know that in your life. No matter what grave matter you may be facing or what grave matters you may face in the future, the grave matters. The empty tomb matters. It speaks to us of hope and triumph and victory if you know the resurrected Lord and Savior. I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to pray for those of you in here today, two groups, two categories of individuals. First of all, those of you that are here that need to rededicate your life to Christ. You've uh, kind of lost your way, and it can happen, I know. But you're here today, and the Lord by His Spirit is calling you back in to fellowship with Him, calling you back into relationship. You need to rededicate your life. Or you're here today, and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen to me in, the, in, the, in Trinity Central, in the chapel, the lower floor. Today's the day. Now's the time. Christ is knocking on the door of your heart. If you will hear his voice and open up the door of your heart, he'll come into your life. He'll have fellowship with you, and you can have fellowship with him. Jesus said, you must be born again. I want to pray for those of you that have never surrendered your life to Christ. With heads bowed, eyes closed, and Christians quietly praying, I'm going to pray that prayer. But before I do, I need to know who I'm about to pray with and pray for. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and look my way. Just make eye contact with me. I'm not going to have you come to the front. I'm going to pray for you right where you're seated. But I want to know who is going to be included in this prayer. So if that's you, just raise your hand and look my way. All over. God bless you. I see that hand. You want to rededicate your life to Christ? God bless you. God bless you. Or you want to surrender your life to Christ? God bless you. Thank you. Hands are going up everywhere. Thank you. I see all those hands right over here. Thank you. In the front row, the second row. Thank you. Over there. Thank you. Okay, you can put your hand down. Even in the chapel, the lower floor, we have pastors and ministers in there. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So say this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Say it with your own mouth. Mean it from your own heart. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive His love, His grace, and His forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my Father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?